and I am really excited to welcome Debbie Howard to the stage, who is the author of not one book, but two books on caregiving, the caregiving journey and the caregiving crisis. And uh, Debbie, uh, welcome. I've been looking forward to this discussion for quite some time. Yes, it's great to be here, Steve. Thank you so much. And um, I want to remind our audience that you can ask questions of Debbie or me or share a statement related to what we're talking about at any point in time. Feel free to use chat to introduce yourself and um, uh, communicate with other members of our audience but probably the best way to make sure that your question gets answered and responded to is use that little Q&A button at the bottom of this, uh, the screen and uh, type in your question at any point in time and we'll make sure that we address it. So Debbie, before we dive into your, your books, let's um, get to know you a little bit better. Tell us a little bit about your background and what led to you authoring these two books. Okay, well, thanks so much, Steve. Um, I am a Japan expert, which sounds kind of funny, but it's important to my caregiving story and my caregiving journey uh, because I was actually living and working in Japan for 24 years when I became a caregiver. So I was what we would call a caregiver from afar, from really afar um, back in 2007. Um, I uh, I'm a market researcher, so basically my job is to help large companies bring their products and services to the Japanese market. And uh, I was able, as the other part of the story that's interesting, I think, for the caregiving background is that Japan is the most aged society in the entire world, uh, with 30% of the population aged 65 or more. And that's compared to about 17% here in the States. And we know how bad it is in the States. So uh, you can just imagine the, the sheer concentration of 65 and over in Japan and what that does to society and the systems and that sort of thing. So I was watching that. I had a front row seat in that, in that culture and society uh, since 1985. And then in 2007, my mother who lived in South Carolina where I was raised, was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And uh, it was a big shock to us all. She was only 74 and she was completely, uh, you know, a, a, a woman who had no meds other than vitamin C. And, um, you know, it was, it, she took really good care of herself. And it was just quite a shock to myself and my two younger sisters. Um, it, it ended up being uh, quite a difficult journey because, of course, I was in Japan, and in the first year, I started going back and forth, uh, just simply traveling more and trying to share the caregiving responsibilities with my two younger sisters, and one of them lived close by, like within one hour, and the other lived three states away, which I learned might as well be in Japan, right? <laughs> because if you're an hour away, if you're more than an hour away, it's a very, very difficult situation, and uh, in, in the end, um, in the last six months of my mom's life, when we could see that she could not uh, really live on her own anymore uh, and needed a lot of support, um, I was the only one able to go back and live full time for those last six months. And that's because I owned my own business in Japan. And um, this is another piece of the story is what happens to us as caregivers when we are working and at the heights of our careers and, and a caregiving situation hits. So um, in, in my case, I was so um, overwhelmed and, and impacted by this experience. Um, and it, it, it's everything, it's the, it's the working and trying to caregive, but it's also the onboarding of medical procedures that we are not prepared to do. I'm a marketing person, right? So <laughs> I don't know about changing oxygen tanks and doing all kinds of other titrating opioids. And, you know, I, I don't know about that. And, and I still don't know very much about it, but I know a heck of a lot more than I did back then. And so it's, it's quite a steep learning curve for all of us. And I don't think I'm saying anything that anybody in this audience doesn't already know, but 
um, it, it really impacted me. And I, I'm a market researcher, again, as I said, and I'm a writer and I'm a communications person. So for me, uh, it, seemed, it seemed a sin not to share my experiences and my observations uh, because um, we only do this once or twice in our lives. And we learn so much so fast and it's so devastating that I thought maybe if I shared my story, it might help. And what I learned was that there are many, many people out there like me who are sharing their stories, which is fantastic. That's what we need to be doing. And that's just a little bit about the history of how I came to write the first book and then got sucked in and wrote the second book as well. I love it. And, and the caregiving journey is the first book that we're going to dive into, which is uh, telling the story of being a caregiver. Okay. And then the caregiving crisis is going to be the second book that we're going to talk about, which is more of a business book. I correct me if I'm wrong. So those of That's you correct. Who are in the audience who may be running uh, home care agencies or be in this provider area, this is a good book there. But I know many of our consumers that attend and are, are these or watch these later or listen to them later are really interested in the inner workings of senior living because they oftentimes, I mean, one of the most common things that I get is I can't believe they only had one person in my mom's assisted living on Sunday afternoon. And that's a, that's a indication of the caregiving crisis we're going to talk about. So um, I, I, uh, I, I, I didn't know about your Japanese background. Uh, Jose says, uh, he goes, we fail to appreciate that here in the US, there are older pockets. Puerto Rico's senior population exceeds 36% brought on by the youth migrations out of the island. Um, I did not know that, Steve, and I, I, I'm very interested in that, Jose, because I'm, I'm actually getting a little more granular with some of this and looking at different states in the U.S. and where do we have the concentrations of the most aged populations. I think Maine also has a super high um, aged population, yeah, so thank you for that. Just like what Jose is saying, I, in New England, I know Vermont and what have you, the kids grow up and then they move and they never come back. And um, but but you really got a glimpse and Jose is getting a glimpse of what the future of the U.S. is going to look like, uh, because I believe we are on track to uh, get close to that 30 percent. Um, uh, in the future. Um, somebody asked, is your mother still with us? Uh, I, I'm so sorry to say that my mother passed away um, as the doctor predicted one and a half years after she got the lung cancer. And um, so she passed away in 2008. And um, that's another part of my caregiving journey and everyone's caregiving journey is uh, trying to relaunch your life when caregiving is done. Mm -hmm. And so for me, caregiving ended in 2008, uh, right as the global financial meltdown was happening. If you remember um, back in 2008, when everybody lost a lot of money <laughs> in their 401ks and everything, that's when my mother passed away. And I had been working uh, with her and helping her for a year and a half. So um, as an owner of a small business, I went into that global financial meltdown in a very weakened state, mm -hmm. not only emotionally and physically from caregiving, but also financially. And it was, it, I, I, I have almost lost my business a couple of times uh, that time. And I had to rebuild it. And after I rebuilt my business, while I was grieving for my mom's death, um, I, I, we, I rebuilt the business. I never really had time to grieve. And, um, and then in March of 2011, which is only, you know, two and a half years later, uh, we had the earthquake in Japan, the triple disaster of wow. the, not only, not only an earthquake, but a tsunami and a nuclear meltdown. So, you know, then again, I lost, I, I like to say, Steve, that I have seen the tips of my plane burning as it went down, right? And I have managed to pull it back up a couple of times. So I, I'm really proud of that. But I, I must say in, to, to the, the listener's question, you know, the, this 
this grieving thing is 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 real and um it takes a long time i don't think we're ever over it i am not over it um part of the way i um take care of myself and give myself therapy is by writing and speaking and trying to make some change in this area that i think is desperately in need of change i love it okay um let's dive into the first book the caregiving journey and i've got the uh for those of you who have never tuned into some of our discussions with authors one format that we found to be helpful is to glimpse at the table of contents and then uh debbie can uh sort of share some insights and comments and um I know that this may be kind of difficult for some to read on their screen, but don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna walk through it verbally. But uh, Debbie, the first thing that I notice is you've broken this down into uh, five parts: uh, the caregiving landscape, planning the unspoken phase of caregiving, surviving and thriving, navigating with grace and ease, uh, relaunching, and then. Part five, The Caregiving Crisis, A Global Challenge, which is the title of your second book. Right, right. So um, when I started writing this book uh, back in, I would say, I think I started officially in the winter of 2016. So let, let's just say mid-2016. And this book came out um, at the end of 2018. So it took me two and a half years, which is pretty good compared to the average. Um, and uh, I, I actually had a big vision to cover all of these areas for the individual. So for people like us who get pulled out of our work and, and our lives to, to be family caregivers. And I, 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 I think my vision was a little bit too big because part five actually ended up becoming the second book. So uh, it, as you point out, um, but I was able to set up the, the themes for it. And, and so that was really valuable to me. Uh, for this book, uh, I did interview over 200 family caregivers because um, as we uh, think about this area, um, and anyone in the business knows this, there's many different kinds of caregiving. And for me, as a, a, a person who cared for my mom with cancer for a year and a half, that is extremely different from someone who has a dementia care receiver for 10 or 15 years. So that, that's a different kind of, uh, of uh, needs, a set of needs for the caregiver. Um, there are many things that are in common for all caregivers, but when we start getting into disease specific conditions, that's when we start uh, breaking out into getting needing some very specialized help and, and background. So I just want to preface it with that. Um, I did try to make this book for uh, to, to find the common denominator that all caregivers need. So when we look at this, um, at the first part of it, we talk about we set up uh, what this problem and challenge is in the world and how there are 53 million caregivers in the United States, how uh, our uh, overwhelmed healthcare system and shortage of healthcare workers contributes to this challenge, um, how the increase in multiple chronic conditions as we age longer contributes to this problem, uh, we, we basically set up the problem and the challenge, uh, and we bring in the family caregiver as the star of the story, because really, um, in my opinion, um, our government and our healthcare systems are failing us. If we as individuals have to step into the tune of the annual budget of Medicare to give free help, that is a problem. And I'm just talking about the states right now because I'm not going to go global on everybody right this minute, but uh, I have a lot of information on global practice best sharing and I'm working on um, doing that and advocating for countries to share the approaches to these different things. Um, we will see how that goes. I'm, I'm making a little bit of headway, but but I I, I did uh, I do set up the problem. I'm not going to dwell on that right now because I think we're all pretty aware of it. But there is a caregiving crisis, and it is affecting 
people like us and probably half, at least half of the people watching this, uh, the people watching this have self-selected. So there's probably quite a bit higher percentage of us who are going to be caregivers. But in any audience I speak to, young or old, half of them are going to be caregivers in the next five years. And, and we know that the world of caregivers has become much more diverse in the last few years. So for example, of the 53 million caregivers in the United States, a quarter of them are millennial aged. And that, that's an astounding statistic. We never thought that before. We always thought it's like middle-aged ladies taking care of their families. And that's why nobody has cared about it. I'm sorry to say, but that is the truth. But now that we're seeing millennial caregivers come up into the mix and many, many Gen X sandwich caregivers who are caring for young children at home and their parents, now we're starting to get some traction with advocacy because now it's affecting a wider amount of people. I think it's a very sad uh, analysis point, but it, it, is, it is my analysis point and I think it's true. Um, it, there's a smack of ageism in there as well, but let's not let's not go down that little rabbit hole. <laughs> so so we got a problem. We got a problem in River City, and we need to be looking at this as a society. And um, this is where we'll bring the companies in in the second book. But let's just talk about what can we do as individuals. I'm a big individualist. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a do-it-yourself kind of gal. Um, I don't depend on the government or anybody else to save my ass, okay? I'm just gonna say it out loud. Mm -hmm. I take care of myself and I try to do that by being proactive. And proactivity is our friend in the caregiving journey. So if we can, the first part of the book is all about planning and planning for caregiving. I wanna make sure we're okay on time. I think we're doing pretty well, aren't we? Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, okay. we break it so, down. We do the first book and then we do the second. And and again, just a reminder, if anybody has any, you know, things they want to share, just jump in. So, um, okay. yes, yes, please. Um, so the planning, the planning piece is so important. And it's also one of it is the most neglected piece. OK, because um, my estimates as a market researcher are that only about five percent of the families in the world have had proper discussions all the way through to the end when uh, about when, like, for example, in my case, what is going to happen in those last two or three weeks of of your life. And uh, in my case, we were very well prepared. My mother at 65, well before she had any type of glimmer of a problem um, made my sisters and I sit down and make sure her will and all her paperwork, uh, DNA, do not resuscitate, all of that DNR was all in order. And she did that because she had just seen her own dad die of a stroke. And, and I think this is so important for us all to look in our own families and what's, what's happening with our grandparents and our great grandparents even, and how did we deal with that as a family? And how are we going to deal with this situation as a family uh, that we are now? And in my mother's case, she forced us to have the conversation. My sisters and I did not want to talk about it. And I hear this so many times, Steve, you know, you'll hear the adult children going, no, I don't want to talk about that. Or it's the parents. It's one of the two usually. But what happens is if you do not talk about it, you will be surprised with a fall or a diagnosis of cancer or Alzheimer's or something. 50% of the situations that put people into caregiving situations are surprises. Yep. So we, we know this statistically. So, and, and, and it's kind of like, you, you know, you're supposed to walk three times a week for 30 minutes, right? But do you do it, right? So we, we know we need to make a plan, but we, most of us put it off until there's a crisis. And, and I tell you, that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons that I've seen, and, and I believe you know this too, is, is that we all know people who, none of this stuff happens to like and none of us have a crystal ball and um it's kind of what we've all got homeowners insurance in case our our then we pay those premiums but very few of us are um you know uh 
activating that policy because our, our house burned down, but we know that we've got to buy that insurance. And this is somewhat similar. And I tell you, Debbie, our most popular topic is solo aging. Um, mm. And one of the reasons I think solo aging is such a popular topic, not just for people who define themselves as solo agers, but for those people, because if you're married, if you really look at it, it's it's highly unlikely that you and your spouse are going to pass away on the same day. One of you is going to be a solo. Um, and I've found that that's helped people plan ahead is, is that, okay, I can't plan for this assisted living stuff, but I could plan for my wife. Um, so. Right. Right. Well, there's a couple of sidebars on that. Um, you know, long-term healthcare insurance in this country, only 10% or less of those over 65 have it. And yet we know if we start looking into it at all, that Medicare does not cover long-term health care at all. So Medicare is for medical things. And that doesn't include long-term health care for the most part, unless you draw all your assets down so much that you are pretty much on the dole. So I, um, you know, we have some decent systems in this country when you don't have any assets, although. I don't believe they're well communicated enough because a lot of people don't get the services that are available, but um, we have really got a long-term healthcare crisis planning uh, situation going on. And uh, I know it's expensive. I personally have long-term healthcare insurance. I, I knock myself out to invest in that because I believe in that. Um, and I, I think some insurance company sooner or later is gonna get smart enough to make caregiver insurance. We should have caregiver insurance, just like we have cancer insurance. This is something that we know is gonna happen, just like you said, Steve. And anyway, it, that's a little bit of my, my rant on long-term healthcare, but it's part of the planning piece, right? Because if you, we also know that 50% of those over 65 in the States have no savings, none, okay? And the amount of savings, the average amount is quite low for the other 50%. So we are not ready as 65 plus year old people in this society, and that's a lot of people, uh, we, we are absolutely not ready for these uh, caregiving situations that are going to happen, healthcare situations that are going to happen and cause caregiving situations. So um, anyway, uh, planning is my, you know, I'm, I'm a crazy lady, you know, talking about planning, but we offer a free 20 point planning checklist for anybody who would like to see it. It's really, really helpful to get you started in thinking about some of the things that you need to do. And it's also important while we're thinking about planning to first take a look at ourselves and our own health. So let's say, for example, you are 40, even 35, you might have already seen some of your, uh, some of the effects of aging, even at 35 or 40. And so if we start looking at our own health situations and we get our own self-care and health under control, we are in a much better position to help our, uh, our aging parents and grandparents, et cetera. Once we learn about our own health and self-care needs, we can start helping our aging loved ones apply that to their lives. Like, let's say I say, okay, I know I have trouble with tending to have high blood pressure. So I'm going to start monitoring that when I'm early in my life. And I'm going to have benchmarks on things like bone density and mammograms. I'm uh, as a female, there's other benchmarks for males, but I'm going to monitor those things. I've been monitoring those things myself since I was 35. And you know what? I know what's going on with me at 68. I'm 68 now. And I do, you know, I think I'm doing pretty well and I'm pretty healthy. Um, you know, I know what my issues are. That is the first step to planning is knowing yourself. And then you start understanding what's going on with your parents and your grandparents and your loved ones. Um, because I think you have to understand yourself before you can help anybody else actually. But um, the idea of planning is to get yourself in order get your loved one's uh, self-care and health in order. For example, you may not understand if your parent has high blood pressure or not. 
you may not understand some of the intricacies of their health care. And probably in America, we get very uncomfortable with somebody getting up in our face and, and, and knowing our health care numbers. But this is what has to happen. We have to have these conversations with our aging loved ones, and we have to create an environment and a relationship between us that we can share these things so that we can help each other. Um, that's about it on the planning side. I say uh, one more thing about planning is that you can make all the plans you want, and you're going to probably have to change them a little bit. But you will have a much better chance of reacting if there is an emergency, if you have a plan in place. So that's the whole rationale behind it. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that nobody really wants to listen until it's too late. But I figure if I keep talking about it, sooner or later, if I drag one or two people every speech into it, <laughs> it might help change the situation overall. Okay, and you had mentioned this 20 point checklist and I found it on your website. So I'm right. seeing, uh, folks, you, you just, uh, I, I guess they just sign up and then you send if, it to them. If they will just sign up for my regular newsletter, I will not de deluge anybody with anything. I have a monthly newsletter. Um, I have a resource guide that is free. I have the 20 point planning checklist. Okay. And I also offer a free challenge every January, a free self-care challenge. And this, the reason I do this is not because I want to work more for no money. It's because I firmly believe that self-care is the foundation of all caregiving management. So if you do, you know, nobody wants to hear this, but, um, but if, if you, are, if you're not in good shape, when you go into this situation, you will, you will struggle more than say I did. Um, and and I was a I was super proactive about my self care while I was caregiving. I made sure I got my workouts in. I made sure I ate well. Um, I did gain some weight, and I did suffer some um, you know absence of physical activity. And certainly, I was super stressed out um, emotionally. But I I did okay. I did fairly well, which is why I'm here to talk with you today about it. I love it. Okay, um, let's see. I'm looking at the clock and I'm wondering, should we, well, oh, let's see, we've got a question. I can wrap it up pretty quick on this one. And okay, we can... cool, but a uh, uh, question, are you, are you still in Japan or are you back in the US? I am still going back and forth, but I'm not going back and forth as much as I used to. Uh, COVID kind of clipped my wings a little bit. And uh, I ended up here in Central Texas between uh, Austin and San Antonio at my home um, right before COVID started. So I wasn't able to go back to Japan for a couple of years. Uh, I just did come back from Japan in October where I uh, was MC of an age tech event that we did there in Japan. And uh, I will be going back in February and March for the same business um, because I'm in, uh, sort of working on the age tech area in Japan. So yeah. I, I get to spend about four months a year there going back and forth. I tell you, I'd love to have you back on to talk about what it's like in Japan and uh, age tech too. But, uh, but sure, any any time we we're doing a lot of great work over there. And it's it's a wonderful, uh, exciting field and opportunity, especially for startups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so let's uh, uh, any other here, I'll, I'm going to bring up the caregiver journey uh, oh let me let me just oh okay this is the content so yeah so uh the the second part of the book gets through sir gets into surviving and thriving while you're caregiving and there are a lot of great tips in there about things you can do to help manage your stress and uh fit in workouts while you're caregiving and i'm not talking about beach body workouts okay i'm talking about five minute walks or, or 10 minute, uh, you know, on the floor with your bands while you're watching TV with your care receiver. So I try to be really practical in all of the tips that I give. And I try to keep in mind how hard it is to be a caregiver and think about all those 200 caregivers who I interviewed um, and, and who I'm still in touch with um, in, in the world of caregiving when I'm giving uh, instructions or uh, recommendations. And then part 
four is relaunching and entering your next chapter. This chapter starts with my mom's passing and goes into how do we pick the pieces up? How do we pick the pieces up after our loved one dies? And how do we get how do we find our own lives back again? And, you know, this is not a, uh, the, none of these processes are very pretty. You know, they're, they're tough, right? It's hard work. And you've got to, you got to be in it to win it. And, and you've got to keep your head straight. A lot of my book is about keeping your head straight and knowing yourself. And, and I think that's uh, really important in this day and age. Great. All right. Well, let's let's transition. This is a great overview. And thanks for sharing your personal story. I know I've received a couple of notes from folks that are they, it, people really like hearing first person stories. And it's something that we're really trying to focus more on um, in the future. But um, now let's let's switch gears to the second book, The Caregiving Crisis, uh, what it costs your business and how you can fix it. And, and I, I want folks that might be in the audience who are caregivers, uh, this will be interesting and it's very important because you can apply pressure to businesses that are in this space to think differently and address this caregiver um, crisis. But I have, another, I, I, um, I have another question that came in as we transition and it's kind of related to this is, is that is it Japan or China where they announced in the news media that is a, it's against the law not to take care of your elderly uh, parents? I know there are some countries that have established uh, policies and legislation that is penalizing people if they live close to the mom and dad and they're not taking care of them. Is is that in Japan or? or I, I think that may be China, but I made a note to to research that. So um, I, I don't think there's a law per se in Japan, but it is very, uh, it would be completely socially unacceptable to not take care of your obligation to your parents. And Asian cultures are much more, uh, much more reverent of, of the aging population than we are. We are a youth oriented, you know, old people don't matter kind of society. Um, and that, that's a really, really horrible thing that I am absolutely trying to change with everything that I do as well. But in the Asian cultures, you will find much more of a reverence for, uh, for the aged population. And part of that is taking care of your loved ones, kind of like we used to do in America, right? Before we lost the, you know, before all the young people started moving to the cities and and, you know, there were lots of things that happened in the 50s that changed the way that we did things that sort of spurred the growth of assisted living and outsourcing your care. I call it outsourcing your care. You can't outsource your care of your loved one, right? Even if you find a good assisted living place, which you will, uh, you have to be actively involved in that situation. It, you, it's really unconscionable to think that you can just outsource your care. But the Asian societies are much more um, apt to uh, keep or help their loved ones at home. Uh, there is much more um, care in the home, for example, in Japan. Uh, they are less penetrated with formal assisted living facilities, although that is growing. And there is a problem with not having enough, but uh, enough capacity. But that's because traditionally the families took care of their elderly at home. Mm. So it, it's a really interesting topic. Whole other show. Oh, no, I'm telling you. Yeah. And we've already got questions coming in related to age tech in Japan. But let's um, let's dive into uh, book number two, The Caregiving Crisis. And what you see on the screen is the Amazon page that I uh, have shared with everybody in chat, but I'm going to scroll down here to this table of contents. And again, it looks like it's broken into four parts instead mm -hmm. of five. Okay. And uh, part one is the upfront answers you need right up front. Part two is fixing the broken system for employee caregivers. Part three is the crisis for companies and their employee caregivers. And part four is workplace solutions and a roadmap. So if you want to give us a glimpse in what we need to know about the caregiving crisis. 
Okay. So, of course, the caregiving crisis is affecting individuals, and that's what the first book addresses, but it also impacts companies. And I'm talking about companies in this book. Um, let's just start with for profit companies, but it also affects every company or entity or organization because we know that 30% of every workforce, whether it's for profit or non profit or whatever type of organization, any type of organization where people work, 30% of that workforce are caring for older loved ones. Okay. So that's not. And that would, there's an overlap between the sandwich caregivers who are caring for young normal children at home, but 30% but are caring for aging loved ones. That's a huge number of any organization's workforce. And so when we think about that, and we think about the impacts on individuals as caregivers, and we've talked about some of those already, emotional stress, physical stress, financial stress, um, the it, it 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 becomes natural to think about well how would that affect the company, and because I'm an entrepreneur and and I help companies do things in the market research area uh, such as launch products in Japan like I am very um, I think in tune with what companies need and some of the struggles that companies have and I've always been very um, I've always had a soft spot for employee relations, employee communications, HR, because um, I uh, my first job was in employee communications. So I had to tell all the employees what the management was doing and what kind of programs we had and, you know, how to work harder, not <laughs> how to work smarter, not harder, you know, all of that good stuff. And so I have a really soft spot for employees as part of an organization and a living human organization um, as companies are. So when I started thinking about this whole problem and, and what I had experienced myself as a working caregiver, a working fa a family caregiver who also worked full time, um, I thought, you know, companies would be a great way to start pushing at reaching the individuals who are caregiving. Because we, we know that of all caregivers, family caregivers, 75% of them work full time. So almost all caregivers actually have another job, a real job, right? Before they go home and do their extra 24 hours of part of, of, of caregiving. So it, it, it's a really interesting thing to think about. And what my, what my thought was is if, if, I could help inspire companies and organizations to look at their workforces and provide support for their employees in this area of caregiving, it could help the problem, is what I was thinking. And so um, my book, uh, this book is designed for businesses. You get all the answers you need in the first 30 pages. It's like a PowerPoint on steroids, okay? So the first 30 pages are all about what is the problem. There's one page for each aspect of the challenge. And um, so if you just read the first 30 pages of my book, you will get the overview of why there's a problem, what it means for companies, and what companies should do about it. And then each of the other parts, part two, three, and four, go into the details of what you can do about it. So it's, it's a pretty good little, um, little primer to the challenge in the world and what it means to your company and, and why, why you should be thinking about this and then what you should do about it. And, you know, I just want to say that, uh, you know, we know that U.S. companies are, a lot of the statistics are U.S. that I use because that's where the best data is and we've done the best and most work on it. But I believe it's a proxy for what's happening in, in companies around the world, because I think it, it's a pretty logical thing when you look at it, it's pretty intuitive. But um, we, we know, for example, that uh, U.S. businesses are spending something like $68 billion a year on things like, it's, it's kind of like bleeding money. It's not 
nobody has the number right there in their face, which is why they don't do anything about it. The, the problem is you've got absenteeism related to caregiving, you've got presenteeism, you've got turnover. 30% of all caregivers end up leaving their jobs and that costs 2.5 times the salary to replace. And you've also got future healthcare costs. So whatever company's paying today in healthcare, if you don't take care of 30% of your workforce who are actually high risk for having future problems because of what they're doing today, you're gonna have future healthcare costs. So this is society-wide as well, but let's just focus on business because that's what I know. And I figured, I gotta say this too, I figured I could get faster traction in businesses than with the government. So I'm just going to say it out loud. I don't mind working with the government and I think government absolutely has a role. And we have some very good movement in our own government towards this, like the 2022 strategy that came out this year for family caregivers. But that is a slow road to hoe. OK, so I, I, I'm going <laughs> I'm doing the typical entrepreneur thing where, you know, I'm going where I can get the most action and that's in big companies. And, and, uh, and, and those caregivers in our audience can sometimes get immediate action by bringing this up to their HR department um, as opposed to government policy is, is that it's that's for a totally other generation. Absolutely. And, and we know just speaking about that for the people in the audience who are employees, this is part of planning, talking with your manager and your company about the fact that you, your parents are getting older and you're getting concerned and you're worried about your role. That is a really valid conversation to have before the fact. And then, you know, what I'm encouraging that's on the employee side, like get, get with the program, start talking about it now and you know that's important steve because a lot of us don't want to admit that we have a problem in our workplace because then maybe we might be overlooked or this and that but we're we're moving into a time where um employee well-being is is much it's a huge issue in companies right now and we can thank the pandemic for that actually it, it made us all sit up and take take notice and so now it's okay to have those conversations with your manager about hey i'm worried about this this is this is this is going to happen and then on the other side i'm encouraging companies to look at everything they offer to their their slate of benefits and start adding components to that that address caregiver needs so if you have a retirement planning program for example add three hours of training for thinking about planning for caregiving, you know, or one hour. It, it, let's start with one hour. Let's, let's do that. If we have a stress and burnout course for rank and file employees, everyone, let's add an hour or two that talks about the specific needs of a caregiver. And we can get into that even if we want to talk about that. We can talk about young caregivers, older caregivers, middle, you know, there's different kinds of caregivers as well. So uh, there's there are many, many things that companies can do today that don't cost an arm and a leg. And my book goes right into this about, you know, looking at what you've already got, plugging in some components that address caregiver needs and um, and, and trying then to see where you can do more, like uh, outsource a care coach benefit that, an employee can pay for. So if I'm an employee and my manager also needs to know about this, right? My manager needs to understand how to coach and counsel me as an employee. So that's another side of the employee training. I love it. All right. Let's see. I'm looking at the clock. We got a few questions. What I'm thinking that let's just have kind of open discussion on anything caregiving, whether it be the workplace Fine. or not. And um the, uh, the other thing that I would add, I go to a lot of meetings where individual companies or collaborative companies uh, in the senior living space, are they, they want to do outreach to large companies in their region. And oftentimes they're, you're approaching the HR and it's sort of like, uh, hey, we'll give a presentation on assisted living or something like that. A suggestion I might add 
is throw out there is link up with Debbie. I got her email um, there and get a copy of the caregiving crisis book. And instead of pitching to come in and give a dog and pony show about your assisted living, just open the eyes to HR about the caregiving crisis. And a great way is to hand them the book, throw your business card on the book, throw a sticker on the book and say, look, you know, I can connect you with the author of this book. I know the author of this book, you know, attended a webinar, whatever. That might be a better door opener than the, um, because an HR department has to choose between 15 assisted livings that are trying to get in their door. But if you're the one that's handing them Debbie's book and giving them real practical uh, ways to address this, maybe that's a solution. Um, well, you know, Steve, um, that's a great idea. And honestly, uh, assisted living uh, facilities in a certain locale could even go so far as to sponsor a series of lunch and learn workshops, for example, where they're not talking about, hey, please come to my assisted living. They're talking about, here's the world of aging and here's the world of self-care and here's the world of uh, dementia signs, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's so many things in the, this is a huge area. We don't have, I'm a marketing person, Steve. We don't have to go in and go buy my thing, buy my thing. Yeah. We don't have to do that because there's so many other great things where you can bring value mm -hmm. uh, that will naturally provide value and lead the customers to your to your solution if if it's really good and providing value yeah so um okay let's see alice uh says i'm 81 i've seen a few friends crash and burn with sudden events that turn their lives upside down and had to leave their homes with no warning those of us who are the older generation are in deep trouble no insurance many of us our solo agers and don't or don't want to burden our children. And uh, oh, Alice says, I'm trying to change some of this in our nonprofit. It's called Outstanding Life, a virtual community for LGBTQA adults. Here, I'm going to cut and paste this into chat so everybody can uh, can see that. Alice, hats off to you with this initiative. And uh, I would agree um, with Alice that. Debbie, in your interviews, you've, I know I've talked to dozens of people that are exactly what Alice described is crash and burning is a good analogy because um, as you had said, it's not just us being prepared, but if you're, if you're older, if the older adult in your family is not financially prepared, it's a lot of pressure to sort of go into your checkbook and pay for services when that's not really your obligation, right? Well, we, we're we seeing a, a generational flow of, of that, that, that money, and that means the next generation will not be ready either. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, a real, it's a real challenge that we have right now. And Alice, I love what you're doing there. Um, I, I, again, I, I would like to go back I think you you might want to consider, you know, starting a planning support group where you could talk with your members about what is their plan. Um, a lot. It's a very scary topic because, you know, we're talking about admitting that you're going to die sooner or later, and that's, and I, I say that really rough because I I'm 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 really aware of this situation, and and it's in my face all the time, and I I'm thinking about it all the time. I'm quite fearful of my own situation and I'm only 68 but I'm not ready and um, I I see the problem Alice and you know what's really interesting is that because the the challenge is so uh, large in our society in our world today we're seeing some amazing innovation in this area so for example we're seeing older people old, let's say older women who are solo agers come together and buy properties together so that they can create their own communities. And we're seeing this happen on a micro scale with let's say three or five little mini houses in a, on a tract of land to uh, you know three to five friends buying 
or renting in the same community. So there, there are some really interesting things happen. We have house sharing happening. We have lots of interesting innovations and services now in this whole area of living options. And uh, it, is, it is going to be very interesting going forward. I, I personally want to make my own place with my own help. I want to hire my own caregivers, my own professional caregivers, because I think um, I will want that. I will want me and a few friends and my own professional caregivers that we choose and share. And, you know, I think it's a little bit of a communal type uh, feeling. And I know in America, we don't like to talk about, you know, communal things and so socialism and stuff. But honestly, that could be a solution for certain people and certain groups of people. And it's already happening in other countries. We're seeing this happen and we're seeing some of it happen in the United States. Does that help at all, Alice? I, I think so. And I, while you were chatting, I pulled up Outstanding Life, uh, the platform that Alice mentioned. And Alice, reach out to me because let's do a discussion on this virtual social network that has been created. It looks like a wonderful program and it's building community um, is what we're all about. And with that, uh, Debbie, actually somebody, our Joan Green, who is this amazing uh, techno guru, guru in this area, she referenced your clubhouse group. And I want to, um, here I'm pulling up the screen there for your profile on Clubhouse. Uh, tell us what Clubhouse is and what this group does um, in Clubhouse if people aren't familiar with it. Okay, great. Thank you so much for asking because I spend a lot of time on Clubhouse. I spend easy 10 12 hours a week. And I do that for free as a volunteer, because I believe it is a good way for us to get the message out on a number of subjects. So uh, my, I'm a co-host on two shows. Uh, one is called uh, Age Friendly Product Alliance. And the other is called News for the Ages. And my uh, I, I the first show, Age Friendly Product Alliance is co-sponsored as well by AARP. And that show is every Thursday from uh, one to two Eastern. And we have a one hour show where we will talk about a certain subject. So we might talk about smart homes or we might talk about, um, we might talk about fitness for older adults. We might talk about caregiver friendly products. Um, we just finished one on December 1st about caregiver friendly workplaces. And we have another one on December 22nd because they let me uh, wedge my caregiver, <laughs> my caregiver content in there. But most of our topics and themes are the, along the wider range of living options, smart homes, fitness products, sleep help, uh, anything to help with aging. And we also, Steve, would love to have you on sometime. And we would love to have you bring some representatives from the assisted living fa uh, facility and residence world, because that is a world that we have not had good access to in the past. So we would love to talk about that more. Uh, we did have a show on nursing shortages the other week. So we, we talk about a lot of things. We're very open-minded. We are we are there to raise awareness and raise the tide so that all boats can float. And that's that one show. And the, the second show is on Tuesdays from six to seven Eastern, News for the Ages. That show, uh, each of us, like five or six of us will bring a recent news article from the last week or so. So it's, it's literally a news feed for anyone in the business. Um, both of these rooms tend to be a little bit B2B focused, if you will, but consumers can also enjoy hearing news articles. And I'm sure Alice would enjoy that and she, Joan would and uh, anyone in the business would enjoy either of those shows. And I personally think individuals could could enjoy some of them as well. And, uh, and, and for those that aren't familiar with Clubhouse, I became familiar with it a few months back. It's it's a, a phone app. That's why I, I pulled up the login. But it's it's just um, a really inclusive, 
social network with a lot of interaction and it's all phone based and um, definitely check out Debbie there. We've uh, both Joan and I have dropped the link in and uh, check it out. Download. I think when you download Clubhouse, what you'll find is you'll find a bunch of great shows on caregiving, but on any topic, uh, there's some really interesting shows. Okay. Somebody asked me uh, about Outstanding Life. This is how I know that uh, Alice, we want to get you all on and host it. And uh, says, Steve, what is Outstanding Life? What is the website and the clear description? I dropped the website into um, chat there, but here is their website. And it's a virtual community for LGBTQ older adults. And as you can see, there's a lot of really cool things. And there's Alice right there. So uh, um, definitely check that out. And uh, thanks for for share, sharing that, Alice. And uh, then somebody else, you know, I love it when our discussions kind of morph into sharing resources and sharing community. And um, uh, let's see, Emily Kearns uh, said, great work, Debbie. Check out the dementia-friendly social movement. If you're not familiar with that, check out Dementia-Friendly America. I dropped that into, uh, into chat there for you all to check that out. And, oh, that's great. Um, let's see. Um, okay. And holy cow, I just looked at the clock. and I can't believe it, Steve. It went so fast, I know. right? But I tell you, um, this has been a wonderful, I love it when we start a discussion and it, the, seeing the rabbit holes that we go down. And that's thanks to our very, you know, engaged and curious audiences is, is that they never fail us in these discussions. And, um, uh, but, but I tell you, Debbie, uh, one of the things that I'd like to get you back on our calendar is just sharing this personal story of living in Japan and your observations on that culture. And I, I think there's some warning signs and some lessons learned for us in this country uh, from your observations, especially as a market researcher there in Japan. Um, Absolutely. And, and one of my, my, this will be the next book, right? <laughs> Best practice sharing. I mean, I'm also connecting through Clubhouse with people in Sweden and Portugal and Israel and all over the world. And, and we all have similar challenges. This is not rocket science, right? This is like, we're going to age. We're going to need certain things. These are, this is a part of life that is just like birth. You know, we, we need to understand that, you know, the journey of life is, is not over until it's over. And we need to look at it that way. There are so many great things that we can do all the way to the end. If we think about it and we plan and, and share resources. Yeah. And, uh, I, I'm dropping in the, uh, the, the page on Debbie's website for the caregiver journey, we had some difficulty finding the, the best link on Amazon for the caregiver journey. Um, so uh, I, I just gave you the link on, um, on her website, but you've also got her email. Just shoot her an email and we can, uh, I'm sure that you can coordinate getting Absolutely. to anybody that needs it. Absolutely. And please watch out for our self-care challenge, our free self-care challenge in January. It'll be our fifth year. And um, we, we, you know, we have like 150 people and everybody is doing one thing a day to, to contribute to their self-care. It can be very, very simple. We're not talking beach body exercise. We're talking yeah. about go buy yourself some flowers, right? Or, you know, do something nice for yourself. I love it. You got some really innovative ideas and products and, and uh, take on things. Debbie, thanks so much, everybody. I can't believe it's Friday. Let's have a good weekend and uh, we'll see you next week. And, and Debbie, I look forward to scheduling this and, and jumping on your clubhouse and being a part of that community as well. Yes, that'll be great, Steve. We'd love to have you. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.